SportsRadioDetroit.com. SRD on SportsRadioDetroit.com. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Lions SRD here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. I'm Ben Sloggy, joined with, as always, Marty Stouffer. Marty, I got a really weird question for you because it's something's been kind of bugging me today. And it's not Lions related in any way, shape, or form or anything like that, but have you ever had a, like, a random song that you normally would not listen to just be stuck in your head? Yeah, all the time. I have two little girls, and, you know, they listen to pop music, and then they listen to, God forbid, I don't know why, but they listen to the kids' bop versions as well. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it happens pretty frequently. So, like, what's one song that gets just randomly stuck in your head when you're driving in the car or, or something like that? Because I think you're going to laugh at the one that uh, got stuck in my head today out of nowhere. They're real big into the Disney Descendants movies, okay. And there's a song in the sec- there's a song in the second movie where the new character Uma sings. It's called "What's My Name," and that damn song will just get lodged in my brain for about an hour, and then finally it'll just it'll just fade away. But oh. it gets lodged in there pretty often because they watch it all the time. You're lucky it's only lodged in there for an hour. So okay, I- I'm at work, right? I'm just minding my own business. Then all of a sudden, I have. Sia's chandelier just stuck in my head and it's like I, 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 it's inexplicable because I I don't listen to music really all, all that much on the radio I usually am listening to like news updates or you know sports updates or you know something I'm usually trying to get in on current events or I'm, I'm listening to Radio Lab that's a good podcast that I listen to I know I, I sound like a really fun guy anywho it's uh <laughs> but like all of a sudden I'm just working and then you know working on my markets and you know getting emails out and everything like that getting corrections and all that good stuff and then all of a sudden yeah chandelier just pops into my head so I'm like god dang. so I I am I'm flipping through like you know on on YouTube getting the song cuz of course now I have to hear it I put it on repeat for a good solid 20 minutes which probably made it worse but man, oh man, I have no idea how it got in there because, as you know, I I live alone, and I don't really listen to that type of music. When I do listen to music, I I listen to pretty much the same stuff you do, and Dave Matthews because that's my favorite band. But like, that's what I listen to, and it's just like all of a sudden, chandelier just pops into my head. It's it is the most random weird thing and i'm going to segue this right back to lions because this is lions srd on sports radio detroit speaking of weird who would have did you like anticipate that entire first quarter being the way it was i mean the lions were getting straight out boat raced by an 0 and 8 team at home and it was just one of the things where you're just like dang because there was there was a there was a stat that the Lions entering Sunday 
they were one and three at home. They're a better road team than they are a home team. So, you know, that kind of played into my head. But that first quarter was messed up, Marty. I mean, what what were your thoughts? Did you kind of want to abandon ship early, or were you just thinking to yourself, nah, they'll turn it around? No, I, I kind of figured they'd turn it around, but it was – it was a little frightening to see Deshaun Kaiser looking like Steve Young out there. I mean, he was just making plays with his feet. He he looked – I'm not going to say he looked great because he didn't, but he looked he looked more than a rookie quarterback. He looked good. He looked ready to go. He looked in command of that offense, mm-hmm. which I think the, the combination of Deshaun Kaiser along with Duke Johnson, Crowell, and Josh Gordon and um, – I'm trying to think of the receiver that was just lighting us up. Oh. Kenny Britt. Yeah, Kenny Britt. They have a good core group of guys there. And Kenny Britt, while he's been inconsistent, when he's on, he's just as good as any receiver in the league. The thing with him has always been health and, and, and actually being on. because he's, he's wildly inconsistent. But he's a good veteran guy there to have him help steady the ship and, and right the ship. And plus, don't forget, they're going to get Corey Coleman back soon too. Mm-hmm. So that, that, young, that offense is going to be young and hopefully – and, and this is I, and I'm a fan of football in general, so I, I like to see I like to see the bottom feeders kind of rise to the top you know, over you know over time. I'd like to see that that group stay together and actually kind of develop into something special because I think they could be special. Yeah, no, I mean it was for me nothing short of just laughable and interesting at the same time. I mean that entire first quarter, the Lions looked bad. I mean they looked awful. They couldn't get into a rhythm. You know, Taylor Decker was still getting his feet wet, playing every other series. You know, the Lions weren't really doing anything. Anytime they tried to run the football, that didn't work. And you're right. Deshaun Kaiser looked unstoppable, just absolutely unstoppable. And, you know, even, I mean, the running game. I mean, you would think the Lions on third down would spy Deshaun Kaiser and they didn't and it paid you know it it paid dividends for Cleveland I mean he had seven carries 57 yards and a touchdown and he had a nice long run of 20 yards Duke Johnson was more you know banging him out you know kind of running and Isaiah Crowell looked really really good for the first time in a while so I mean, it was nice the Lions scored 17 unanswered points. You know, it was fortunate that Nevin Lawson got that uh, strip six just because he was badly beat on that route and on a last-ditch effort, put his hand on the football, created a fumble, and was able to score with it, so that was fun. But, yeah, I mean, it was just until Diggs hit Kaiser and he just – got knocked out of the game, you know, for, I think, three series. It looked like Cleveland was going to climb back into this one and maybe steal one at Ford Field. And that's something that I, I, I wanted to talk about only because there's positives and negatives about that, right? I mean, obviously the negatives are, you know, the Lions, even though it's unlikely, should in theory have maybe one or two losses in their final eight games and compete for the NFC North. That's the positives that that's a positive, but there's also a lesson in this that you can't take any team lightly, which I guess is a positive, but then also the negative is there was an O and eight team that came into your house and outplayed you close to a half of football, which, which side are you on? Like, cause for me, like seeing both sides, I think it was kind of good that the Lions got hit in the mouth a little bit, only because they know that they can't take anyone lightly going in. And you know Matthew Stafford last year or last week saying, "Well, we literally have to take this one game at a time because it helps us focus." What what's your mentality? You know, with just overall in that regard, I'm right there with you. Uh, I, I actually kind of think they needed to get smacked in the mouth a little bit. I think this game was a a much needed uh, much needed wake up call, for lack of a better term, for Jared Davis, who just looked flat out putrid in this game. And as a rookie, he's going to have games like that. It happens. It happens to veterans. But I mean, Jared Davis looked bad in this game, and it's it, it's 
that sucks to say because, like you, you know, I've said before in this podcast, I think he's a he's a franchise changing pick. I really do. I think he's that good. I think he's that special. But again, he's a rookie, and he just he looked lost. He looked he looked like Michael Roberts does when Michael Roberts takes the field on, on offense. Like he just looked like he had no clue what was going on, which is weird because I mean, even in Florida, he he didn't he didn't that never really happened with him in Florida. So it just it was it was a it was a really weird game, and then you know. Uh, they they put up two hundred some rushing yards on on the Lions, which was bizarre. So it was just, it was a really really strange game. But I I kind of I'm kind of with you. I, I see both sides, and uh, you know I definitely think that's they they took the Browns lightly, and they shouldn't have because the Browns are despite the win loss record they're actually not a terrible team. They just can't get it all going at once. Yeah, I mean to speak to that really quick, uh, forget I forget what Lions player it was. I think it was Glover Quinn said that Cleveland is arguably one of the most talented teams, even though they're young, that the Lions had faced this year. And he said they have 25 really talented guys on that roster. And lo and behold, um, you know, someone in the Lions blogging community fact-checked it and turned out to be the Browns were in top 10. I think they were eighth in the league in talent, just talent overall. So maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe there's not. But it's just it's something that's weird, too, because there was another stat that was kind of interesting that the last four teams that played the Lions were all playing the Lions from you know a bye week. The Lions were the first, first opponents in a bye week. So you know, you're talking the Packers, Browns, Steelers, and Saints all getting the Lions immediately after a bye week. So that was interesting. That shouldn't that's not going to happen the rest of the way. But another thing just really quickly on the rest of the season Sunday also also didn't do the Lions any favor whatsoever. Minnesota still won and Green Bay still won. So Detroit not making up any ground in the NFC North is kind of frustrating in a way. Um, it, it, obviously you have the tiebreaker against the Packers, but it was just, you know, the Packers, uh, bears game was frustrating. There was that controversial challenge that John Fox did where one of his running backs was diving out of bounds and he was fumbling the footballs. He hits the pylon, which by rule is an automatic touchback. And granted that would have been a, um, a, t- a game tying touchdown for the bears, but the Packers, you know, somehow still staying in it, still fighting. And the reason why that's scary is because if the Packers are still really close, like they were in 2013, four years ago, when Aaron Rodgers got hurt, if they're close to a division title, Aaron's going to do anything he can to get back on that field and steal another division title. And if you truly want to hang a banner in Ford Field that's not, hey, playoff appearances, woohoo, like an actual banner, that's got to be on the, in the back of your mind. And that's why, again, I, I wanted to bring up you know, why it possibly could have been good. But I don't know. It's just it's something that, you know, when, when you're watching the game, it's just Jim Caldwell still making really weird decisions. You know, that challenge on fourth down didn't really make any sense. The Browns still converted. Um, You know, it it was just, it was just baffling how this, how flat this team came out against the Browns. And I I don't know if it's in the back of your head, Marty, or anything like that, but there's also plus and minuses with Jim Caldwell. You know, obviously Caldwell is two and two in Green Bay. You know, not a lot of Lions coaches have done that. He's gotten the Lions to the playoffs more recently than any recent Lions head coach. You know, I mean, there's things that he does that are good, and then there's things that make you want to, you know, punch your TV. Do you still have any hesitation with the contract extension that the Lions signed, you know, apparently at the, you know, in the offseason that they kept quiet or, or not? Because, for me, it was 
the way that first quarter went was totally inexcusable. I don't care how much ta- talent the Browns have. They're 0-8. That game should not have been close. And I don't think if Deshaun Kaiser gets knocked out, I don't, I don't think it's a guarantee that the Lions win either. No, I, I agree with you, but I don't have a problem. I, I stand by what I've said all season. I don't have a problem with the extension because I don't see a coach out there that's better suited to take take the job. I really don't. I mean, you know, I, I wanted Wisenhunt initially, but who knows how things would have went. I mean, he, he, we don't know what that guy would have done as a head coach in Detroit. Um, you know, I still feel like Caldwell's the booby prize, but if it's it, it's been an all right booby prize because it's, it's, it's paid off pretty well. Uh, I don't see anybody out there that's just ready to to be a, a, a head coach right now. I mean, that's that's just me. I mean, you never know. I mean, some, they might they might go into the college ranks and pull some guy from North Wyoming State or something that might be some kind of Bill Walsh second coming. You know, we we don't know. But looking at the broad landscape, I just I don't see anybody out there. So I'm I'm okay with Caldwell getting the extension. I'm I'm kind of glad that you mentioned the college ranks. Did you see Sporting News is putting Jim Bob Cooter's name out there for a possible head coaching candidate at University of Tennessee? No, I didn't see that, but I'm not surprised. I mean, he's he's done an admirable job. This season, some of his play calling has been a little iffy, but, I mean, that happens with, with, all, with all offensive coordinators. I mean, here in Pittsburgh, we have Todd Haley, and you, I mean, you guys don't get to hear it, but this fan base, literally in the course of four plays, Two plays they love them, two plays they hate them. So I mean, it's that's that's just that goes with the territory. Offensive coordinators get a lot of a, a lot of um, flack, but they also get a lot of credit at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I'm not surprised to see him, his name out there. I mean, it's I hope he doesn't go because staff seems to respond really well playing for Jim Bob Cooter. Uh, Cooter seems to bring out the best in him. So I I don't I don't, I don't want to see him go, but at the same time, you know. If he goes, more power to him, and that's he, he's deserved the job. Yeah, see that that's where I'm I'm at with with it. As much flack as Jim Bob Cooter gets from a lot of people in this town, I mean, I know a lot of people were railing on him for the Steelers, right? In in that game, and they're like, yeah, why are you running the football so much? It's not working. The Steelers don't have a good run defense. You're supposed to attack weaknesses. He's trying to see. If the if something will break, if something will give, like you can see a little method to the madness there. And granted, yes, sometimes the scheme doesn't make sense, like not doing a pop pass to Jared Abadaris or you know last week or anything like that. You know, yes, there's some issues with scheme, but you cannot say he hasn't helped Matt Stafford at all. I mean, he has. Stafford has cut down his interceptions. He's looked a lot better. You know, granted, with Scott Lenahan, Stafford could just, it was an aerial circus. He could just wing it and sling it whenever he wanted to. But now with JBC, it seems like he can, you know, wing and sling it as he wants to, but it's more smart. It's more smartly done. And it's just, I don't, I want to see what these guys can do. You know, I've had doubts with Terrell Austin as as defensive coordinator. He's actually seeming to get a lot out of this team, whether or not you you know want to admit that. I mean, the defense this year is turning over the football, getting points off turnovers. They're creating pressure. I mean, this defense in the first eight games played pretty well. So the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, arguably, you could say, you know, as Bob Quinn. Maybe I give these guys raises in hopes that they stay. I know when people hear that, they're probably going to dry heave and be like, oh my God, I can't believe you just said that. You can do so much better. Maybe that's the case, sure. But the grass isn't always greener on the other side of that fence. Sometimes, just sometimes, you have to stick with what you have. And when I saw that, I mean, yes, it's great. I mean, it shows that Jim Bob Cooter's had success with what he's done and he should be maybe a head coach. I know a lot of people wanted uh, Caldwell fired so that Jim Bob Cooter could be the head coach here. You know, I mean, a lot of people think that highly of him. He was a guy that, you know, worked with 
Peyton Manning and, and, and helped Peyton Manning be Peyton Manning. I mean, there's backstory there. And I think it would be a mistake if you let him go. I mean, again, yes, scheme can get better. And you can have growth and learn how to get better with your scheme. But I would be remiss if, if Cooter left. I mean, if he became the head coach at Tennessee, I'd be bummed about it. I, I, I really would. I think the Lions are onto something here because you can definitely see that the culture is changing under not only you know Mrs. Ford, but with Bob Quinn, I mean, you can see the culture is changing. Because I don't think I, I do think going back to how ugly this game was, an old Lions team would have easily folded. I mean, they would have. I mean, it, it, it would have been something where I don't think a, a Lions team would have the fortitude. Which it, this sounds terrible, but I, I think they would have folded to an zero and eight. Browns team and giving them a win and then of course people would be saying ha ah, same old Lions you guys suck you choked away another one yeah I, I I'm with you you know um Ben you know this I mean every day I live in Pittsburgh every day I'm at work I'm wearing something Detroit whether it's a Tigers hat whether it's a Lions hat whatever I've all it's typically a hat because I have to wear a uniform but I've always got silver and blue on I've always got something Detroit on and I, I mean, I take a lot of abuse because Pittsburgh is a very hardcore city for their Steelers. And, you know, the, the, the running joke uh, yesterday was, oh, you guys barely beat the Browns. And, yeah, you guys barely beat the Colts this week with a team of backups. Like, watching the Steelers and Colts game this week was like watching that movie The Replacements. Like, it was all backups and guys that shouldn't be in the league that were actually starting. Like, and I'm like, your Steelers barely beat them. Like, so, like, how are you going to give us guff about Cleveland? Yeah, Cleveland – figuratively caught us with our pants down but we pulled them up buckled the belt and went back to work i mean it was just it was a weird game and it's just it, that's just the way football goes sometimes and like i said i, I don't want to see cooter gone but at the same time if it's better for him then more power to him well i, I think it's funny that Cle or steeler fans were giving you flack because the steelers and the browns went down to like the last 30 seconds of that game until it was decided so at, at least the Lions had this one in hand, well in hand, you know, midway through the fourth quarter. But yeah, the Steelers have no room to talk. I mean, yes, they beat the Lions straight up head to head, but I don't see how that fan base can give flack about a team not like you said. I mean, against the Colts, they looked bad, but against the Browns, they didn't look much better either. <laughs> so right. I mean, I mean that that right there. It to me that that's funny, but. One thing I, I do want to give you kudos on, Marty, because you said this last week, and I will, uh, well, I'll, I'll let the audio speak for itself. I hope it's this week because I want to see him, you know, like I said last week, even if it's on a pitch count, bring him in, just get him get him acclimated, get him back in quote-unquote game shape. Um, That's right. Our own Mar Marty Stouffer looked into a crystal ball that is quote-unquote his brain, and actually knew what the Lions were going to do with Taylor Decker. We, I mean, we knew Decker was coming back. There was, I mean, there were so many signs in the tea leaves. If, you know, you didn't want to read them, that's just your fault. But, yeah, Taylor Decker came back, and he was rotated. And he played still 69% of, uh, of the snaps. But, Marty, you said it was going to be a pitch count. Lions put him on a pitch count. He only got beat a couple of times by Miles Garrett, um, you know, gave up a quarterback hit, but I don't think he gave up a sack. I got to give you kudos, man. You were, you were Johnny on the spot there. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. But I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of what they had to do. I mean, Mahalik wasn't, I mean, Mahalik was serviceable, but he's not, he's not your franchise left tackle. He's not your anchor. He's not your, he's not the guy that's protecting Stafford's back. He's not the guy that's going to get, you know, a big contract as, as that guy, which I think Decker will do in, what, two more seasons. I think his contract's four years. But, uh, you know, it, it's just common sense. You don't want to come out there and you don't want to put him out there in the first game and have him play in every snap when he's been out for how long, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was just the pitch count was like the only thing that made sense. So, I mean, it was it was good to see. And Decker looked sharp. He did. I mean, you know, sure, he gave up, a, well, he gave up one quarterback hit and a couple hurries. But, I mean, I'll take that any day over having, you know, Greg Robinson out there flailing around like a fish. 
Yeah, and Corey Robinson was actually in at right guard filling in for T.J. Lang, who was in concussion protocol. There hasn't been an injury report yet because, lo and behold, we're not recording this on a Wednesday, so it doesn't have to come out yet. But Corey Robinson did, a, after you know a couple of shaky first series, and he hasn't played guard since high school. He looked really, really good. I mean, this is still a team that is working with a patchwork offense, and they're still getting you know the job done. And the thing that was interesting, because Marty, you again pointed this out last week, the Browns only gave up an average of 2.9 yards a carry. And Detroit did a lot better than that. I mean, their running game was really, really good. It looked good. It was... It was something that was really, really refreshing. I mean, it was Amir Abdullah was making the right cuts. He was able to get, you know, free. And the Lions' yards per rush was close to double the average the Browns give up. It was 5.5. So the running game, you know, is still a work in progress, but it's showing signs of life. It's not necessarily awful, which, which is great, but someone else came back. That was really, really crucial late, well, at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Kenny Galladay made two big, big catches down the sideline to get the Lions offense moving and, you know, not stalling. And Galladay came up big, and it was nice to see him in. I, I'm not looking at a uh, snap count in front of me for Galladay, but in limited action that he saw, he was a lot more than just serviceable. I mean, he was impactful. And he was targeted three times, caught two passes, and he had that 50-yard grab again in the fourth quarter, which was just fantastic. Going over the top of a defender to get that football, easing into it and still having enough juice in his hamstring to, to break one. That was really, really nice to see. Yeah, it was definitely the Galladay season, you know, and it, that's kind of been a running joke between the two of us. And uh, you know, it, it was good to see him back because, and and you know, you know, it's he's a high draft pick. He's somebody you want to see evolve. He's a, and and I, and I never really realized it, but he's a big dude, Ben. He's a big cat out there on that field. He's got freakish talent, man. I, like he's just. Uh, he's he's going to be a lot of fun to watch when he matures a bit and finally you know the when he finally catches up to the NFL game because losing as many weeks as he did to injury that 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 couldn't have felt that can't that can't be good for his for his development but at the same time they haven't really missed him all that much because TJ Jones has been spectacular in in his limited capacity like he's been really good and he's he's earned his playing time as well. But yeah, that that catch that Galladay had for the what, fifty-one or fifty-two yards or whatever it was was it was it was fun to watch and it looked like uh, it looked like I saw somebody I don't know who it was somebody was calling him Baby Tron and it was just uh, it was kind of funny because he, he did look he did look like Calvin on that play a little bit even though we've agreed that that is a bad nickname but one thing that yes. was in- <laughs> I was gonna say one thing that was interesting uh, was speaking of wide receivers because. Really, I don't know if it's quietly, but he, I don't think he's getting the praise he deserves. I mean, T.J. Jones is one of them. I mean, in Galladay's absence, I'm right there with you, Marty. I mean, he's stepped up in limited amount of snaps and played very, very well. But Golden Tate now has at least 85 receiving yards in four straight games, which is the longest streak in the NFL since the start of 2016. The thing that's interesting about that is Golden Tate has played no more than 70% of the snaps in any of those games because of injury. So you look at how he's doing it, and a lot of it is, you know, yak yardage. And, you know, there was that touchdown that Stafford threw to him on the tunnel screen where it was an audible that Stafford, you know, called into. And the tunnel screen worked to perfection. Golden Tate caught it and was gone. I mean, he hit the seam immediately after the line of scrimmage and left everyone in his dust. I think it was three 
maybe four Brown defenders just flat-footed, and he scored. And, I mean, that's something that happens a lot. He's consistently in the top five of wide receivers uh, in the NFL, and a lot of people just don't give him a lot of credit because they're all like, oh, well, it's just you know yards after catch. You know, it, it's like, okay, he's still got to throw him the football, still has to make a move with the football, and he's being dynamic with it. it it's He's been more valuable, I think, as a Lions wide receiver than I can than I can imagine. And I would say he's even maybe more valuable than when Calvin Johnson was here because this guy is half his size and he's putting out arguably almost – the same workload. I mean, what Golden Tate's doing is really, really impressive in my eyes. Yeah, and let's face it: when Calvin was here, not a, not one single team that was that was an opponent was putting two guys on Golden Tate. They were doubling up on Calvin. Right. So, so Tate was getting single coverage. I mean, that's that's I mean, that's the smart thing to do. So it's kind of like, okay, well, that's why he looked so good when Calvin was here. Well, he has his play has not dropped off since Calvin left. Right. I dare say it's actually gotten better. You know, it's funny because people people will not, for whatever reason, they will not call him, whether it's in real life or whether it's in fantasy football terms. They people refuse to call him a wide receiver one. Oh, he's not a go-to guy. He's not a legit receiver. Uh, yeah, he really is. Take a look at his stats, people. It's, it's what the guy can do. And when they signed him here, I want to say three was it three or four years ago they signed him here. I was kind of like, yeah, all right, you know, he, whatever, he'll be fine. He's, he's a nice, he's not going to get much because Calvin's here. And I, I was wrong. And, and you know, and, and you probably saw it on Facebook not too long ago. I actually said that I enjoy watching Stafford and Tate more than I enjoyed watching Stafford and Calvin. I, I understand the, the the type of receiver they are is completely different, but I, I just it, it seems to me like Stafford and and Tate just I don't know, man. They mesh so much better in my opinion. Than, than Calvin and, and Stafford because he almost had to pass he almost had to force the ball to to Calvin I, he doesn't have that monkey on his back now like he can kind of freelance it but he he instinctually goes to to Tate and like those two have a have a connection that you don't see very often uh, anymore like 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 you could see Montana and Rice that was a, that was a natural chemistry you could see um, Culpepper and Moss. That was a good chemistry. You, you know, here in Pittsburgh, we had Roethlisberger and Heinz Ward. That was, na- but like other than that, there's not too many natural chemistries out there, and these two have that. And that I don't think that can be understated either. But Golden Tate has been outstanding since coming to Detroit. Yeah, no, I mean he he really has. He's been, like I said, he's been a, very enjoyable, and I don't think gets as much love and respect that he, that he deserves. I mean, you're right with Calvin Johnson. It, it, for a while, it was just 500 ball. You would just chuck it and see if he would come down with it. With Golden Tate, you have to be more creative than that. You can't just throw it up there and hope he comes down with it. But it's it's something that's been just really nothing short of impressive. And one other topic that we've had, and we talked about it last week a little bit. You know, Jerry Jones suing the league, but... He's also trying to block Roger Goodell's extension. But we have a little game show here on Lions SRD this week where what should, or what else I should say, Roger Goodell asked for in his contract because it was reported he wanted $50 million a year, health benefits, and he wanted the use of a private jet whenever he wanted. So... We will first go to Marty Stouffer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Marty, what should Roger Goodell ask for in his contract extension? That any time he does a televised interview, his, he goes through a voice modifier to make his voice sound like Kit from Knight Rider. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you got anything else in there? I don't I, like I racked my brain to think of that one today. <laughs> it's my brain's like a wrung out sponge today. No worries. Here's a couple of things that I thought of a lifetime supply of Papa John's pizza, a one hour look at the unredacted JFK files, slightly used concert t-shirts from 1973, 
a statue in Canton made in silver plating, the same silver as the Lombardi Trophy, which he also would then get to rename the Commissioner Roger Goodell NFL Championship. So those are just a couple of things that he asked for in his extension. If you have any of those you want to add to the list, feel free to tweet at Sports Radio DET with the hashtag LionsSRD, and we will retweet those um, things you come up with. Those are just a couple of just to get the pot going, and you can join the hottest game show sweeping the country. What should Roger Goodell ask for in his contract extension? Because, I I mean, it's something that it's – I think it's inevitable, inevitable that it's going to happen. I just think Jerry Jones is still being extremely petty considering this is just about one player. I don't care how anyone slices it. It's literally just about Zeke Elliott not being able to play, which I think is extremely two-faced because, as I said on the SRD Roadshow on Saturdays from 9 to 11 on CRB Radio, if you want to catch that live, on demand here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. But this is the same guy who, amid the Ray Rice scandal, Signed Greg Hardy, a guy who beat and choked his girlfriend and then threw her down on a bed of guns and still signed him to be a Dallas Cowboy without batting an eye. So you want to sue the league just because Zeke Elliott can't play, I think is the most petty thing and two-faced thing you could ever do as an owner. And there's even been talks that the other NFL owners, if he goes through a lawsuit with the league, I thought this was amazing because it was uh, pro football talk and Mike Florio that reported this. The other 31 owners in the league, if he tries to sue the league, they're going to try to have, they're going to fight back allegedly and basically strip Jerry Jones of the Dallas Cowboys. They basically wouldn't, he wouldn't be allowed to own the Dallas Cowboys anymore, which I kind of now want to see this go into the courts because that would be insanely ish- interesting. I don't think that will ever happen, but I thought that was something that was interesting. One interesting news bit uh, that came out today mentioned Jared Abedaris. He's no longer a lion. He's been waived. Jace Billingsley and George Johnson are now Lions. Lions waived another player as well to make room for those two. But, Marty, I know you really liked the Jared Abadaris uh, signing way back in the offseason when it first started. I think it was all the way back in April, maybe May, after the draft. And they took a shot on a guy. And he he wasn't bad. I mean, in the preseason, he was good. He actually worked his way onto the main roster, still was serviceable, never was really thrown the football much or used much, but he still held a spot, still held his own. What were your, what's your thoughts of Abadaris leaving? Yeah, I'm, I'm bummed. I, I hate it. It's nothing against Jace Billingsley, but I'd rather have a guy who's a proven player who can, who can block downfield. He can do all the things that Abadaris was able to do as opposed to, oh, hey, let's re-sign a guy that captures Detroit's hearts for a couple weeks. I, I don't care about Jace Billingsley. I, I don't. I, I, I'm i a big Aberderis guy. I remember him um, having a you know a nice year or two, whatever it was, with, with Rodgers. Now, keep in mind, he had a nice year or two with Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback when he was like the fourth or fifth string receiver in Green Bay. So, I mean, those numbers, you translate those to, uh, to a team where he's actually getting playing time, it's going to expand – his numbers are going to look better than they, than they did then, too. But I like what he was able to bring. He's a g- really, really good downfield blocker. He's smart. He's a crisp route runner. Uh, I believe it was either Nebraska or Wisconsin he went to school. I could be wrong there, but he I know he was one of their better he was one of their better players that they had had in, in quite some time. So it's kind of it's it's bummer to see him go, especially when again, no offense, Jace Billingsley, like why? It just it, it bothers me, but I wish him nothing but the best. I'm really bummed to see him go. I am too, just because I, I, I liked his potential. I really did. I thought, you know, him 
with the Lions holding on to the spot that he did. I thought that was a nice story, nice little comeback story. But then I'm also really curious to see if Jace Billingsley is ever going to crack this lineup. <laughs> I mean, I, I really am. I mean, you get – he's one of those guys that gets dangled in front of you like the carrot, you know, in front of a, a horse that gets the wagon going. In every preseason game, you see this guy – making plays granted yes it's against third and fourth string guys never really against second or first string guys but the carrot's still out there you're like man i wonder you know i i wonder if jace billingsley has it in him to be a good slot receiver but granted you have golden tate running out of that slot just as well and you know being equally effective but yeah, it's just it's something that I don't know if he's I don't know if he's ever going to see the field. I don't know why they keep bringing him back. I would have maybe stuck with Abadiris because whenever they wave Billingsley, no one signs him. No one even adds him to a practice squad. He's he's out there and then he's just dangling. So if you really wanted to, you could maybe wait until the end of the season. But I mean, it's a moot point now, obviously, because. He's gone. I mean, Abadiris is gone, and he's here. So something that's really interesting, really quick, there's a odds chart to make the NFC playoffs. Obviously, leading the way is the top four, with the Rams at 84%, the Vikings, who sit on top of the NFC North at 87%, the Saints at 93%, and the Eagles at 98%. So those four are pretty much locks. After that, you have the Seahawks at 7-2, and two, the Panthers at 6-8, and eight, and then you have the Lions at 31%. So it's something that this race is going to get close. It's going to get very, very close for that wild card because that's why I, I, think, the, I think the Lions need to win the NFC North. Because as of right now, that log jam is not getting any better. You're still behind the Falcons, who's at five and four, and they're four and one in conference, which still mind-bogglingly good. But you lost to the Panthers, that hurts. So yeah, I mean it's something that I, I don't know if Detroit really gets up there, but you still have that log jam because you still have the Dallas Cowboys at five and four, even though they're probably going to lose to the Eagles this week. You have the Packers at 5-4. and four. The Vikings this week actually gets to battle the Rams, so that's going to be interesting uh, to see how that goes because as a Lions fan, you need the Vikings to just get punished by the Rams just so that game on Thanksgiving is really, really interesting. I mean, either way, you need to beat the Vikings on Thanksgiving because if there's a tiebreaker, if you have the same record at the end of the year, you get the NFC North because you beat them twice. So, yeah, it's something that is going to be interesting to see if the Lions can actually complete because as of right now, they are eighth in the league. So we'll see what happens. I mean, before we wrap it up, we're going to quickly talk, obviously, about the Bears. We said earlier, Bears losing to the Packers. And this is a Bears team that is struggling. I mean, really, really struggling. I mean, Mitch Trubisky's come in, gives them some semblance of life. They have beaten the Ravens. They have beaten the Panthers. But they've lost to the Saints. When they did, it was close. And when they lost to the Packers, it was close. Marty, is there anything that scares you about the team from the Windy City, which the Lions travel to on Sunday? Yeah, not knowing who's going to show up. I mean, are we going to get a good Lions team? Are we going to get a bad Lions team? Are we going to get a Chicago Bears that looks competent at playing football? That's, that, to me, scares me more than the Bears themselves. Trubisky's an unknown. He's an unknown commodity at this point because they, they really haven't asked him to do much. They've asked him to do a little bit more each week. But like I, I, he right now doesn't scare me. I'm not trying to disrespect the guy or anything. But right now he doesn't disrespect me. He's just another guy. Their receivers, they don't scare me at, at all. So even if Trubisky goes, goes out there and plays well, they've got a couple of guys catching the ball. They don't, I, I honestly can't even think of any of their names. Um, they, that, that's what scares me more than anything. I, I think the Lions, 
will beat themselves if they lose to Chicago. If they lose to Chicago, it's because they beat themselves. And I'd be remiss to say it on this podcast because I, we all know I trash Eric Ebron quite a bit on the show. I want to tip my cat, my cap to Eric Ebron because he looked like a starting quality, a quality starting tight end this week. Granted, against the Browns, I know, I know, I know, but still, he looked really good this week. I got, I don't, I don't recall seeing any egregious drops. Maybe one. He he looked good. And I think he's another X factor that's going to help this team win if he can if he can develop and get his confidence back. Um, but I that that's what scares me the most is just not knowing which team is going to show up for for either side. Yeah, I mean Eric Ebron caught the dagger in the heart touchdown. Uh, you know that put the Browns away on that sweet long bomb by Stafford, which Stafford basically said, "Well, I punted that football, and somehow he caught it." But it's something that the Bears. They only have, I mean, Dontrell Inman in one game has basically become the Bears' best wide receiving threat. But Oh, yeah, I forgot about Inman. Yeah, they got him from San Diego. Right, and here's the thing. The Bears are still 31st in the league in passing yards. They, they barely average 170 yards a game. Rushing yards, however, they're ninth in the league, so... It's something that this kind of reminds me of what the Monday night football game was against the Packers. You know, you have a young quarterback who has potential, but the running game is going to be more serviceable. So you can make the Bears one dimensional and make them throw. You know, they don't they don't score a lot of points. They're twenty eighth in the league in points. They it's at sixteen point seven, so they're not even averaging 17 points or more. Uh, so it's something that the Lions should easily win this game. They really should. Heading into the Thanksgiving game against the Vikings, this should be a game that the Lions easily take control of. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Bears. We don't know, as you said, Marty, you know, if the Lions are going to sleepwalk you know, or not, if they're just going to come out and win the football game the way they should. But I want to remind people that Darius Slay tweeted that right when the Bears drafted Mitch Trubisky, he tweeted, man, that guy's going to get picked off a lot. So it's time for Darius Slay and the Lions defense to kind of put their money where their mouth is because that tweet's out there when, again, Mitchell Trubisky was picked by the Bears at, what was it, third overall or second overall? Um, Second, I think. Yeah, either way, it was too high. But time to time to have that rubber meet the road. But we will talk about it. We will talk about it before Thanksgiving, and then we will talk about the Thanksgiving game after Thanksgiving, probably on that Saturday or Sunday. But we will talk about it. There will be probably two podcasts next week. And I think that's all the time that we have for uh, this week, unless you have anything to add, Marty. Uh, just one little thing that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, it, it's a little Minnesota Vikings news. Uh, unless it's happened since since before we started recording, uh, Zimmer has not announced a starting quarterback yet. Um, he I, apparently is considering starting Bridgewater. I don't know if I'd go that route as much of a Teddy Bridgewater fan as I am. Keenum's looked good. He's looked really strong against uh, you know against the opposition this year. He's looked he's looked pretty good. And I don't know if I want Teddy's first start coming against the Rams if I'm Mike Zimmer. But, you know, as of right now, as of Tuesday at 830 or whatever it is, they, they have not announced a starter yet. So it's it's kind of interesting to see what's going on up there in Minneapolis. Well, I hope to God Mike Zimmer botches this quarterback call because that's I want the Lions to get all the help that they can, you know, that they can get to overtake the Vikings. Because until the Packers start losing and and whatnot – if the Vikings can get in their own head, that only helps Detroit. So, either way, you know Bridgewater. I don't think he's going. I mean, he's going to be rusty. So, and I don't think you start him on a short week in Detroit. Which, if that doesn't happen, that works. I think in the Lions' favor because they already, you know, they already faced Case Keenum uh, and the Vikings. So, I think that does help on Thanksgiving on a short week because you really can't do anything. You can't really game plan. You can't install anything. It's just a familiar opponent, which I also think helps. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully Mike Zimmer and the Vikings 
just get in their own head with this quarterback situation, even though uh, if you're on Twitter, Anthony Broom thinks that Bridgewater may still be the more viable option because eight times out of ten so far, Case Keenum's been pretty solid, but it's those two times out of ten, he looks really, really awful. So there's still inconsistencies with Case Keenum. So, yeah, like I said, hopefully that happens because if the Vikings get in their own way, that only helps Detroit. But he's Marty Stover. I'm Ben Salagi. What do we say, Marty? And we say goodnight. Good night.